Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And Paranormal Expeditions. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five minute mystery is being brought to you by diplomats from around the globe. A good diplomat shows up with a gun in one hand and a sandwich in the other and asks which you prefer. That's my thought for today. Which has nothing to do with the story. True. You go on alone and I'll wait here. Nothing doing. Oh, Sheriff! Sheriff, please! Hey, somebody calling me. A man there, Henry. Come in this way. Oh, Sheriff! Oh, gee, I'm mighty glad I found you, sir. Hey, what's the matter, Rube? Something wrong? Tony Claire, the star aerialist over in the big top. She was just found murdered in her tent. Now, let's get this straight. Cause of death, strangulation. Grease paint smears on her throat and several small, fresh scratches on the palms of her hands. Costume also grease smeared. Well, what do you say, Sheriff? We can't keep the crowd waiting in the big top all day. As company manager, what do you think? It's kind of upset your show, doesn't it? Why don't you talk to the voodoo doctor? He was the last one with her. Might be a good idea. Which one's he? Well, he's right over there, Sheriff. The one in all the paint. Ah, so you're the voodoo doctor? Yes, sir, I am. What's your name? What do I call you besides voodoo doctor? Just call me Neil. Urban here tells me that you might be able to throw some light on the murder of Miss Claire. Urban, eh? I thought so. Why, you... Eh, no rough stuff there. Eh? Now, talk, Neil. Eh, don't feel like it. Well, Urban, suppose you tell me what you know. Well, Sheriff, just before the show started, I saw the voodoo doctor sneak away from Dottie's tent. Dressed just as he is in costume. Yeah, huh? grease from head to foot. I waited until he passed and then looked into Dottie's tent. She was dead. And you think that Neil, the voodoo doctor... Kill Dottie? I'm sure of it. I heard him threaten her. That's a lie. Dottie asked me to come to her tent. But she was dead when I got there. Did you touch anything? Not a thing. I'm not so crazy as to leave fingerprints on somebody else's dirty work. Does everyone in the show use the same grease paint that you have on, Neil? No. I'm the only one. As a voodoo, I have to paint up like this. Well, if you and Urban were the only humans to be near the body before she was murdered... And he's your man, Sheriff. I don't think so, Urban. I think you're in for a little surprise. You see, I'm holding you for the murder of Dottie Claire. Why did the sheriff arrest Urban, the show's manager, for the murder of his aerialist? In a moment, we'll hear, but first... In my opinion, Neil the voodoo doctor seemed much more guilty here. I wonder what we missed this time. Honestly, Ron, I clearly missed something as well, but it was a fun story. It was. Music, people having fun, and of course, Neil the Voodoo Doctor. I always love a good voodoo segment. It bloody well warms the heart. It does. However, someone did kill the girl. All we can do is listen to the solution. Agreed. And now, back to our story. You're crazy, Sheriff. You ain't got one piece of evidence against me. Haven't I, though? Listen, you claim it was Neil that came out of the tent after Dottie Claire was murdered. Neil's torso and his face and hands are covered with grease paint. It's all over the dead girl's costume, too, ain't it? What more could you want? Just something you overlooked, Urban. Anyone struggling with him would have grease paint all over his own hands, too. But the only marks on Dottie's hands were scratches. This is proof enough that Dottie Claire did not struggle with your voodoo man, as you said. And consequently, he couldn't have strangled her. Oh, Urban, looks like you slipped up that time. And that slip is going to cost you your life. 
Well, the devil's in the details. And they most certainly left out the details. Well, we probably should have wondered about those scratches. Hindsight is 2020. And foresight is best left to fortune tellers. Oh, that is a good one. Ah, you got my sideshow reference. I did. Rather clever. Why, thank you. Welcome to the podcast. One of my favorite things about doing the show each week is the research I get to do and the things I find while doing it. This week I found something pretty amazing. It's said that science fiction is nothing more than a formula genre. By that I mean it's predictable and has become a lost art. Well that may be, but if you look hard enough and long enough, the world may just surprise you. During its heyday, there were so many new angles to explore that I think people have forgotten just how versatile science fiction can be. Today, it's all about what sells. How many remakes and interpretations must we endure before the powers that be realize this? Back in the day, I think they got it, hence the golden age of science fiction. What I found for you today is an angle of sci-fi that I had never seen before. It's the idea of what diplomacy might look like through the eyes of an alien race. But writing this story would take first-hand knowledge of the subject, and let's face it, most writers have never been diplomats. Enter Keith Lamar, who just happened to be an Air Force pilot who became a diplomat just after World War II. He would be the perfect person to write such a story, and that's what we have today. It is titled The Yilian Way, and I think you're going to like it. Lamar went on to create a series of stories using this topic, and I can't wait to see if I can find more of them. They truly are something special. Speaking of amazing stuff, here's one of those things that make you say, what? Once a week, I get a quick report of how we rank on the Apple Podcast charts. While in most categories, we're not in the top 100 or even 200 for that matter, so there's very little point to the report. However, there are a few exceptions. For example, we're always in the top 100 in the Philippines. This week, we appeared in a new chart. We ranked number 50 on Apple Podcasts in Greece under the category of fiction. How about that? In addition, the episode The Black Seagull came in at 95 overall, and the episode Skinwalkers came in at 122. I can honestly say I'm amazed, and I want to thank the people of Greece for listening to the show. Now, Let's get this podcast going with my review of another great audiobook. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to? The Short Strange Life of Herschel Grinspan, a boy Avenger, a Nazi diplomat, and a murder in Paris. On the anniversary of Kristallnacht comes this untold story of a teenager whose act of defiance would have dire international consequences. On the morning of November 7, 1938, a 17-year-old Jewish refugee, Herschel Grinspan, walked into the German embassy in Paris and in an act of desperation assassinated Ernst von Raff, 
a low-level Nazi diplomat. He did it, he said, out of love for his parents and his people. Two days later, von Rath lay dead, and the Third Reich exploited his murder to inaugurate its long-planned campaign of terror against Germany's Jewish citizens. This book is not just a history of young Grinspan. Best-selling author Jonathan Kirsch brings to light this wrenching story re-examining the historical details and moral dimensions of one of World War II's most baffling cases. Was Grinspan a deranged lone gunman, a psychopath, or was he an early resistance fighter? Kirch illuminates a life cast in shadows of history in a compelling biography that is part page-turning historical thriller and part legal drama. Here is a clip from the introduction of the book. On an otherwise unremarkable day in the fall of 1932, a man entered a Munich restaurant called the Osteria Bavaria, took a seat at an empty table, and ordered a vegetarian meal. With his brush moustache and an unruly apostrophe of black hair across his forehead, the solitary diner was already famous around the world as the leader, the familiar German word is Führer, of the Nazi party. Only a few months later, on January the 30th, 1933, he would be raised to the formal rank of Chancellor of Germany. Remarkably, his customary entourage of bodyguards and cronies was absent from the crowded restaurant. Adolf Hitler was dining alone. There he sat, a raw vegetable Genghis Khan, recalled the patron who happened to be sitting at the next table. A teetotaling Alexander, a womanless Napoleon, an effigy of Bismarck, who would certainly have had to go to bed for four weeks if he had ever tried to eat just one of Bismarck's breakfasts. The gentleman who observed Hitler eat his meal was Friedrich Percival Reck Malachaven, an erstwhile doctor and now a journalist. Born into the Prussian Junker class, he moved in privileged circles and had encountered Hitler, Josef Goebbels, our Minister of Lies, and Hermann Goering, obviously mentally deranged, in the salons of their rich and powerful benefactors. Reck Malachaven, however, was one aristocrat who held the Nazis in contempt, and he imagined that Hitler grew uncomfortable under his critical gaze on that day in the Osteria Bavaria. Since at that time, September 1932, the streets were already quite unsafe, I had a loaded revolver with me. In the almost deserted restaurant, I could easily have shot him. If I had had an inkling of the role this piece of filth was to play, and of the years of suffering he was to make us endure, I would have done it without a second thought. But I took him for a character out of a comic strip, and did not shoot. Fate never afforded Rek Malachaven another opportunity to take a shot at Hitler. Still, the same thought occurred to other and bolder men. The most memorable attempt took place on July the 20th, 1944, when a German officer named Klaus von Stauffenberg, a titled member of the German nobility, planted a bomb in the Wolf's Lair, the field headquarters where Hitler was meeting with his military high command. But the explosion failed to kill the Führer, and the co-conspirators were quickly identified and arrested, tried and convicted. The failed assassins were tortured and then hung from meat hooks on lengths of piano wire. In a bizarre series of events that would rapidly involve Rippentop, Goebbels, and Hitler himself, Grinspan would become the centerpiece of a Nazi propaganda campaign that would later describe his actions as the first shot of the Jewish war. It is surprisingly well-read, is a historical drama, and will hold your interest unto the very end. And there's more good news. You can have The Short Strange Life of Herschel Grinspan for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This includes free access to the Audible Plus catalog, which is updated monthly with new titles. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories 
and you can get your free book today. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. Our podcast theme this time is The Diplomat, and you might think your stories would probably have no connection to that. Well, I'm constantly amazed by what you send into the show. No, we don't have a story about diplomacy, but we do have one that comes to us from the Philippines and a very famous hotel. The Dominican Hill Retreat House, also commonly known as the Diplomat Hotel, is an abandoned structure atop the Dominican Hill in the Philippines. It was built in 1915. Originally, it was set up as a seminary, but the school closed two years later and the building was converted to a hotel. During World War II, the people fleeing from the Japanese sought refuge within its halls. Japanese forces invaded the property and turned it into their headquarters. During the liberation of the Philippines in April of 1945, the American forces bombed the place and partially hit the right wing of the building. Between 1945 and 1947, the building underwent restoration. Diplomat Hotels acquired ownership of the property in 1973. The building sustained significant damage during the 1990 Luzon earthquake, and it was closed. Our story comes from a ghost hunter and friend of the podcast, George McMillan. George visited the property in early 2019 and tells us of his adventure. Hello, Ron. I have a collection of stories for you that just might be a perfect fit for your new segment, Paranormal Expeditions. Here is a taste from the adventures I had while at the Diplomat Hotel in the Philippines. My wife is from there and we visit often. I've always wanted to do some ghosting while there, and in January of 2017, I got my first chance. Many more were to follow. The Diplomat is one haunted place. So let's get to the interesting parts. In 2019, activity started a few minutes upon our team's arrival. Here's just two of the events. One night I was sleeping on an old couch in the main lobby. There's a walkway that leads into the dining room, which I could see on the left side, opposite the staircase, which was on my right. We had our command center sitting on a table there, but for the moment it was on man. Then I heard what sounded like Mexican music. This music played for about one minute before completely stopping. I was both confused and scared because it made no sense. I walked over to the command center and replayed the recording. It was there, loud and clear. I checked with the team, and no one even brought any Mexican music with them. We had a video camera, and sure enough, the music was playing there also. However, this time, we all watched as an orb floated down the stairs and stopped right above my head while I slept. This sent chills down my spine. Another night, in the same room, I heard footsteps coming down from the staircase, and I heard a deep growl, like from an animal. I shut my eyes hard and tucked my blanket in around me to make myself feel safe, because I felt certain I was going to be attacked. But nothing came. Only the intense feeling of being watched while I cowered in fear. All in all, we documented 15 pieces of evidence and more personal experiences than I could count. The hotel is now being renovated, so it can no longer be investigated. It will be interesting to see what happens when the place reopens. George McMillan, Macon, Georgia. 
Well, George, that does sound like it should be a paranormal expedition segment. And consider this to be your official invitation to come back and tell us the rest of the story. Amazing. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com and click on the story submission banner. Leave your story, give it a title, and tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story this week comes from author Keith Lamar and the pages of World of If Science Fiction, January of 1962. It is the introduction of Lamar's recurring character, James Retief, who is a low-level diplomat. The ceremonial protocol of the Yield was impressive, colorful, and in the long run, deadly. It was up to Retief to figure out how to respond to their overtures in the correct manner, all the while keeping his superiors from making a deadly mistake. The story is titled The Yelian Way and is expertly read for us by John Larmor, who is no relation to the author. The Yelian Way by Keith Larmor. The ceremonious protocol of the Yills was impressive colorful, and in the long run, deadly. James Retief, Vice Consul and Third Secretary in the Diplomatic Corps, followed the senior members of the terrestrial mission across the tarmac and into the gloom of the reception building. The gray-skinned Yule guide who had met the arriving embassy at the foot of the ramp hurried away. The Counselor, two First Secretaries, and the senior attachés gathered around their ambassador, their ornate uniforms bright in the vast, dun-colored room. Ten minutes passed. Retief strolled across to the nearest door and looked through the glass panel at the room beyond. Several dozen Yill lounged in deep couches, sipping lavender drinks from slender glass tubes. Black-tunicked servants moved about inconspicuously, offering trays. A party of brightly dressed Yill moved toward the entrance doors. One of the party, a tall male, made to step before another, who raised a hand languidly, fist clenched. The first Yule stepped back and placed his hands on top of his head. Both Yule were smiling and chatting as they passed through the doors. Retief turned away to rejoin the terrestrial delegation waiting beside a mound of crates made of rough, greenish wood stacked on the bare concrete floor. As Retief came up, Ambassador Spradley glanced at his finger watch and spoke to the man beside him. Ben, are you quite certain our arrival time was made clear? Second Secretary Magnan nodded emphatically. I stress the point, Mr. Ambassador. I communicated with Mr. Takai Kai just before the lighter broke orbit, and I specifically... I hope you didn't appear truculent, Mr. Magnan, the Ambassador said sharply. No, indeed, Mr. Ambassador. I merely... You're sure there's no VIP room here? The Ambassador glanced around the cavernous room. Curious that not even chairs have been provided. If you'd care to sit on one of these crates... Certainly not. The ambassador looked at his watch again and cleared his throat. I may as well make use of these few moments to outline our approach to the more junior members of the staff. It's vital that the entire mission work in harmony in the presentation of the image. We terrestrials are a kindly, peace-loving race. The ambassador smiled in a kindly, peace-loving way. We seek only a reasonable division of spheres of the influence with the yield. He spread his hands, looking reasonable. We are a people of high culture, ethical, sincere. The smile was replaced abruptly by pursed lips. We'll start by asking for the entire Serenian system and settle for half. We'll establish a foothold on all the choicer worlds, and with shrewd handling, in a century we'll be in a position to assert a wider claim. The ambassador glanced around. If there are no questions... Retief stepped forward. It's my understanding, Mr. Ambassador, that we hold the prior claim to the Cyrenian system. Did I understand your excellency to say that we are ready to concede half of it to the Yill without a struggle? Ambassador Spradley looked up at Retief, blinking. The younger man loomed over him. 
Beside him, Magnum cleared his throat in the silence. Last Council Retief merely means... I can interpret Mr. Retief's remark, the ambassador snapped. He assumed a fatherly expression. Young man, you're new to the service. You haven't yet learned the team play, the give and take of diplomacy. I shall expect you to observe closely the work of the experienced negotiators of the mission. You must learn the importance of subtlety. Mr. Ambassador, Magnan said, I think the reception committee is arriving. He pointed. Half a dozen tall, short-necked Yill were entering through a side door. The leading Yill hesitated as another stepped in his path. He raised a fist, and the other moved aside, touching the top of his head perfunctorily with both hands. The group started across the room toward the terrestrials. Retief watched as a slender alien came forward and spoke passable Terran in a reedy voice. I am Ptoy. Come this way. He turned, and the group moved toward the door, the ambassador leading. As he reached for the door, the interpreter darted ahead and shouldered him aside. The other Yul stopped, waiting. The ambassador almost glared, and then remembered the image. He smiled and beckoned the Yul ahead. They milled uncertainly, muttering in the native tongue, then passed through the door. The Terran party followed. Give a great deal to know what they're saying, Retief overheard as he came up. Our interpreter has forged to the van, the ambassador said. I can only assume he'll appear when needed. A pity we have to rely on a native interpreter, someone said. Had I known we'd meet this rather uncouth reception, the ambassador said stiffly, I would have audited the language personally, of course, during the voyage out. Oh, no criticism intended, of course, Mr. Ambassador. Heavens, Magnan put in. Who would have thought? Retief moved up behind the ambassador. Mr. Ambassador, he said. I... Later, young man, the ambassador snapped. He beckoned to the first counselor, and the two moved off, heads together. Outside, a bluish sun gleamed in a dark sky. Retief watched his breath form a frosty cloud in the chill air. A broad, donut-wheeled vehicle was drawn up to the platform. The yield gestured the Terran party to the gaping door at the rear, then stood back, waiting. Retief looked curiously at the gray-painted van. The legend written on its side in alien symbols seemed to read, Eggnog. The ambassador entered the vehicle, the other terrestrials following. It was as bare of seats as the terminal building. What appeared to be a defunct electronic chassis lay in the center of the floor. Retief glanced back. The Yill were talking excitedly. None of them entered the car. The door was closed, and the Terrans braced themselves under the low roof as the engine started up with a whine of worn turbos. The van moved off. It was an uncomfortable ride. Retief put out an arm as the vehicle rounded a corner, just catching the ambassador as he staggered, off balance. The ambassador glared at him, settled his heavy tri-corner hat and stood stiffly until the car lurched again. Retief stooped, attempting to see out through the single dusty window. They seemed to be in a wide street lined with low buildings. They passed through a massive gate, up a ramp, and stopped. The door opened. Retief looked out at a blank gray facade, broken by tiny windows at irregular intervals. A scarlet vehicle was drawn up ahead the Yule Reception Committee emerging from it. Through its wide windows, Retief saw rich upholstery and caught a glimpse of glasses clamped to a tiny bar. Patoy, the Yule interpreter, came forward, gestured to a small door. Magnan opened it, waiting for the ambassador. As he stepped to it, a Yule thrust himself ahead and hesitated. Ambassador Spradley drew himself up, glaring. Then he twisted his mouth into a frozen smile and stepped aside. The Yill looked at each other, then filed through the door. Retief was the last to enter. As he stepped inside, a black-clad servant slipped past him, pulled the lid from a large box by the door, and dropped in a paper tray heaped with refuse. There were alien symbols in flaking paint on the box. They seemed, Retief noticed, to spell eggnog. The shrill pipes and whining reeds had been warming up for an hour when Retief emerged from his cubicle and descended the stairs into the banquet hall. 
Standing by the open doors, he lit a slender cigar and watched through narrowed eyes as obsequious servants in black flitted along the low, wide corridor, carrying laden trays into the broad room, arranging settings on a great four-sided table, forming a hollow square that almost filled the room. Rich brocades were spread across the center of the side nearest the door, flanked by heavily decorated white cloths. Beyond, Plain white extended to the far side, where metal dishes were arranged on the bare tabletop. A richly dressed Yill approached, stepped aside to allow a servant to pass, and entered the room. Retief turned at the sound of Terran voices behind him. The ambassador came up, trailed by two diplomats. He glanced at Retief, adjusted his ruff, and looked into the banquet hall. "'Apparently we're to be kept waiting again,' he muttered. After having been informed at the outset that the Yill have no intention of yielding an inch, one almost wonders. Mr. Ambassador, Retief said. Have you noticed? However, Ambassador Spradley said, eyeing Retief, a seasoned diplomatist must take these little snubs in stride. In the end... Ah, there, Magnan. He turned away, talking. Somewhere, a gong clanged. In a moment, the corridor was filled with chattering Yul who moved past the group of terrestrials into the banquet hall. Patoy, the Yul interpreter, came up and raised a hand. Wait here. More Yul filed into the dining room to take their places. A pair of helmeted guards approached, waving the terrestrials back. An immense, gray-jowled Yul waddled to the doors and passed through, followed by more guards. The chief of state? Retief heard Magnan say, The Admiral for Cow, Cow, Cow. I have yet to present my credentials, Ambassador Spradley said. One expects some latitude in the observances of protocol, but I confess. He wagged his head. The Yill interpreter spoke up. You now will hie on your intestines and creep to festive board there. He pointed across the room. Intestines? Ambassador Spradley looked about wildly. Mr. Patoy means our stomachs, I wouldn't wonder, Magnan said. He just wants us to lie down and crawl to our seats, Mr. Ambassador. What the devil are you grinning at, you idiot? The ambassador snapped. Magnan's face fell. Spradley glanced down at the medals across his paunch. This is, I've never... Homage to gods, the interpreter said. Oh, oh, religion... Someone said. Well, if it's a matter of religious beliefs, the ambassador looked dubiously around. Golly, it's only a couple of hundred feet, Magnan offered. Retief stepped up to Putoy. His Excellency, the Terrestrial Ambassador, will not crawl, he said clearly. Here, young man, I said nothing. Not to crawl? The interpreter wore an unreadable yield expression. It is against our religion, Retief said. Against? We are votaries of the snake goddess, Retief said. It is a sacrilege to crawl. He brushed past the interpreter and marched toward the distant table. The others followed. Puffing, the ambassador came to Retief's side as they approached the dozen empty stools on the far side of the square, opposite the brocaded position of the admirable Fakau Kau Kau. Mr. Retief, kindly see me after this affair, he hissed. In the meantime, I hope you will restrain any further rash impulses. Let me remind you, I am the chief of mission here. Magnan came up from behind. Let me add my congratulations, Retief, he said. That was fast thinking. Are you out of your mind, Magnan? The ambassador barked. I am extremely displeased. Why? Magnan stuttered. I, I was speaking sarcastically, of course, Mr. Ambassador. Didn't you notice the kind of shocked little gasp I gave when he did it? The terrestrials took their places, Retief at the end. The table before them was of bare green wood with an array of shallow pewter dishes. Some of the yell at the table were in plain gray, others in black. All eyed them silently. There was a constant stir among them as one or another rose and disappeared and others sat down. The pipes and reeds were shrilling furiously, and the susurration of Yillian conversation from the other tables rose ever higher in competition. A tall Yill in black was at the ambassador's side now. 
The nearby yill fell silent as he began lading a whitish soup into the largest of the bowls before the terrestrial envoy. The interpreter hovered, watching. That's quite enough, Ambassador Spradley said as the bowl overflowed. The yill servant rolled his eyes, dribbled more of the soup into the bowl. Kindly serve the other members of my staff, the ambassador said. The interpreter said something in a low voice. The servant moved hesitantly to the next stool and ladled more soup. Retief watched, listening to the whispers around him. The yill at the table were craning now to watch. The soup ladler was ladling rapidly, rolling his eyes sideways. He came to Retief, reached out with the full ladle for the bowl. No, Retief said. The ladler hesitated. None for me, Retief said. The interpreter came up and motioned to the servant who reached again, ladle brimming. I don't like it, Retief said, his voice distinct in the sudden hush. He stared at the interpreter, who stared back, then waved the servant away. Mr. Retief, a voice hissed. Retief looked down the table. The ambassador was leaning forward, glaring at him, his face a mottled crimson. I'm warning you, Mr. Retief, he said hoarsely. I've eaten sheep's eyes in Sedan, Kasway in Burma, hundred-year Coog on Mars, and everything else that have been placed before me in the course of my diplomatic career, and by the holy relics of St. Ignatz, you'll do the same. He snatched up a spoon-like utensil and dipped it into his bowl. Don't eat that, Mr. Ambassador, Retief said. The ambassador stared, eyes wide. He opened his mouth, guided the spoon toward it. Retief stood, gripped the table under its edge, and heaved. The immense wooden slab rose and tilted, dishes sliding. It crashed to the floor with a ponderous slam. Whitish soup splattered across the terrazzo. A couple of odd bowls rolled across the room. Cries rang out from the yill, mingling with a strangled yell from Ambassador Spradley. Retief walked past the wild-eyed members of the mission to the sputtering chief. Mr. Ambassador, he said, I'd like... You like? I'll break you, you young hoodlum. Do you realize... Please... The interpreter stood at Retief's side. My apologies, Ambassador Spradley said, mopping his forehead. My profound apologies. Be quiet, Retief said. What? Don't apologize, Retief said. Patoy was beckoning. Please, I'll come. Retief turned and followed him. The portion of the table they were ushered to was covered with an embroidered white cloth set with thin porcelain dishes. The yill, already seated there, rose amid babbling and moved down the table. The black-clad yill at the end of the table closed ranks to fill the vacant seats. Retief sat down and found Magnan at his side. What's going on here? the second secretary said angrily. They were giving us dog food, Retief said. I overheard a yill. They seated us at the bottom of the servants' table. You mean you know their language? I learned it on the way out. Enough, at least. The music burst out with a clangorous fanfare, and a throng of jugglers, dancers, and acrobats poured into the center of the hollow square, frantically juggling, dancing, and backflipping. Black-clad servants swarmed suddenly, heaping mounds of fragrant food on the plates of yill and terrestrials alike, pouring a pale purple liquor into slender glasses. Retief sampled the yill food. It was delicious. Conversation was impossible in the din. He watched the gaudy display and ate heartily. Retief leaned back, grateful for the lull in the music. The last of the dishes were whisked away and more glasses filled. The exhausted entertainers stopped to pick up the thick square coins the diners threw. Retief sighed. It had been a rare feast. Retief, Magnan said in the comparative quiet, what were you saying about dog food as the music came up? Retief looked at him. Haven't you noticed the pattern, Mr. Magnan? The series of deliberate affronts? Deliberate affronts? Just a minute, Retief. They're uncouth, yes. Crowding into doorways and that sort of thing. He looked at Retief uncertainly. They herded us into a baggage warehouse at the terminal. They hold us here in a garbage truck. Garbage truck? Only symbolic, of course. They ushered us in the tradesman's entrance and assigned us cubicles in the servant's wing. Then we were seated with the coolie class sweepers at the bottom of the table. You must be... 
I mean, we're the terrestrial delegation. Surely these Yill must realize our power. Precisely, Mr. Magnan. But with a clang of cymbals, the musicians launched a renewed assault. Six tall, helmeted Yill sprang into the center of the floor and paired off in a wild performance, half dance, half combat. Magnan pulled at Retief's arm, his mouth moving. Retief shook his head. No one could talk against a Yill orchestra in full cry. He sampled a bright red wine and watched the show. There was a flurry of action, and two of the dancers stumbled and collapsed, their partner opponents whirling away off to pair off again, described the elaborate pre-combat ritual, and abruptly set to, dulled sabers clashing, and two more Yill were down, stunned. It was a violent dance. Retief watched, the drink forgotten. The last two Yill approached and retreated, whirled, bobbed and spun, fainted and postured, and on the instant clashed, straining chest to chest, then broke apart, heavy weapons chopping, parrying as the music mounted to a frenzy. Evenly matched, the two hacked, thrust, blow for blow across the floor, then back, defense forgotten, slugging it out. And then, one was slipping, going down, helmet awry. The other, a giant muscular yill, spun away, whirled in a mad skirl of pipes as coins showered, then froze before a gaudy table, raised the saber, and slammed it down in a resounding blow across the gay cloth before a lace of bow-bedecked yill in the same instant that the music stopped. In utter silence, the dancer-fighter stared across the table at the seated yill. With a shout, the yill leaped up, raised a clenched fist. The dancer bowed his head, spread his hands on his helmet. Retief took a deep gulp of pale yellow liqueur and leaned forward to watch. The beribboned yill waved a hand negligently, spilled a handful of coins across the table, and sat down. The challenger spun away in a screeching shrill of music. Retief caught his eye for an instant as he passed. And then the dancer stood rigid before the brocaded table, and the music stopped off short as the saber slammed down before a heavy yill in ornate metallic coils. The challenged yill rose and raised a fist. The other ducked his head, put his hands on his helmet. Coins rolled, and the dancer moved on. Twice more, the dancer struck the table in a ritualistic challenge, exchanged gestures, bent his neck, and passed on. He circled the broad floor, saber twirling, arms darting in an intricate symbolism. The orchestra blared shrilly, unmuffled now by the surf roar of conversation. The yill, Retief noticed suddenly, were sitting silent, watching. The dancer was closer now, and then he was before Retief, poised, towering, saber above his head. The music cut, and in the startling, instantaneous silence, the heavy saber whipped over and down with an explosive concussion that set dishes dancing on the tabletop. The yill's eyes held on Retief's. In the silence, Magnan tittered drunkenly. Retief pushed back his stool. Steady, my boy, Ambassador Spradley called. Retief stood, the yill topping his six foot three by an inch. In a motion almost too quick to follow, Retief reached for the saber, twitched it from the yill's grip, swung it in a whistling cut. The yill ducked, sprang back, snatched up a saber dropped by another dancer. Someone stop the madman, Spradley howled. Retief leaped across the table, sending fragile dishes spinning. The other danced back, and only then did the orchestra spring to life with a screech and a mad tattoo of high-pitched drums. Making no attempt to follow the weaving pattern of the Yill Bolero, Retief pressed the other, fending off vicious cuts with the blunt weapon, chopping back relentlessly. Left hand on hip, Retief matched blow for blow, driving the other back. Abruptly, the Yill abandoned the double roll. Dancing forgotten, he settled down in earnest, cutting, thrusting, parrying, and now the two stood toe-to-toe, -to -toe, sabers clashing in a lightning exchange. The Yill gave a step, two, then rallied, drove Retief back, back, and the Yill stumbled. His saber clattered, and Retief dropped his point as the other wavered past him and crashed to the floor. The orchestra fell silent in a descending wail of reeds. Retief drew a deep breath and wiped his forehead. Come back here, you young fool, 
Spradley called hoarsely. Retief hefted the saber, turned, eyed the brocade-draped table. He started across the floor. The yill sat as if paralyzed. Retief! No! Spradley yelped. Retief walked directly to the admirable Fakau Kau Kau, stopped, raised the saber. Not the chief of state, someone in the terrestrial mission groaned. Retief whipped the saber down. The dull blade split the cloth and clove the hardwood table. There was utter silence. The admirable Fakau Kau Kau rose, seven feet of obese gray yill. Broad face expressionless to any Terran eyes, he raised a fist like a jewel-studded ham. Retief stood rigid for a long moment. Then, gracefully, he inclined his head, placed his fingertips on his temples. Behind him, there was a clatter as Ambassador Spradley collapsed. Then the admirable Fakau Kau Kau cried out and reached across the table to embrace the terrestrial, and the orchestra went mad. Gray hands helped Retief across the table. Stools were pushed aside to make room at Fakau Kau Kau's side. Retief sat, took a tall flagon of coal-black brandy pressed on him by his neighbor, clashed glasses with the admirable, and drank. Retief turned at the touch on his shoulder. The ambassador wants to speak to you, Retief, Magnan said. Retief looked across to where Ambassador Spradley sat glowering behind the plain tablecloth. Under the circumstances, Retief said, you'd better ask him to come over here. The ambassador? Magnan's voice cracked. Never mind the protocol, Retief said. The situation is still delicate. Magnan went away. The feast ends, Fakau Kau Kau said. Now you and I, Retief, must straddle the council stool. I'll be honored, Admirable, Retief said. I must inform my colleagues. Colleagues, Fakau Kau Kau said. It is for chiefs to parley. Who shall speak for a king while he yet has tongue for talk? The Yil way is wise, Retief said. Fakau Kau Kau emptied a squat tumbler of pink beer. I will treat with you, Retief, as viceroy, since, as you say, your king is old and the space between worlds is far. But there shall be no scheming underlings privy to our dealings. He grinned a yill grin. Afterwards we shall carouse, Retief. The council stool is hard, and the waiting handmaidens delectable. This makes for quick agreement. Retief smiled. The king is wise. Of course. A being prefers wenches of his own kind, Fakau Kau Kau said. He belched. The Ministry of Culture has imported several terry, excuse me, Retief, terrestrial joy girls, said to be top-notch specimens. At least they have very fat whatchamacallits. The king is most considerate, Retief said. Let us to it then, Retief. I may hazard a fling with one of your terries myself. I fancy an occasional perversion. Fakau Kau Kau dug an elbow into Retief's side and bellowed with laughter. Ambassador Spradley hurried to intercept Retief as he crossed to the door at Fakau Kau Kau's side. Retief, kindly excuse yourself. I wish a word with you. His voice was icy. Magnan stood behind him, goggling. Mr. Ambassador, forgive my apparent rudeness, Retief said. I don't have time to explain now. Rudeness, Spradley barked. Don't have time, eh? Let me tell you. Lower your voice, Mr. Ambassador, Retief said. Spradley quivered, mouth open, speechless. If you sit down and wait quietly, Retief said, I think... You think? Spradley spluttered. Silence, Retief said. Spradley looked up at Retief's face. He stared for a moment into Retief's gray eyes, closed his mouth, and swallowed. The Yill seem to have gotten the impression I'm in charge, Retief said. We'll have to keep it up. But, but, Spradley stuttered. Then he straightened. That is the last straw, he whispered hoarsely. I am the terrestrial ambassador extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary. Magnan has told me that we've been studiedly insulted, repeatedly, since the moment of our arrival. 
kept waiting in baggage rooms, transported in refuse lorries, herded about with servants, offered swill at the table. Now I and my senior staff are left cool in our heels without so much as an audience while this, this multiple cow person hobnobs with, with... <clears throat> Spradley's voice broke. I may have been a trifle hasty, Retief, in attempting to restrain you. Blaspheming the native gods and dumping the banquet table are rather extreme measures, but your resentment was perhaps partially justified. I am prepared to be lenient with you. He fixed a choleric eye on Retief. I am walking out of this meeting, Mr. Retief. I'll take no more of these deliberate personal... That's enough, Retief snapped. You're keeping the king waiting. Get back to your chair and sit there until I come back. Magnan found his voice. What are you going to do, Retief? I'm going to handle the negotiations, Retief said. He handed Magnan his empty glass. Now go sit down and work on the image. At his desk in the VIP suite aboard the orbiting core vessel, Ambassador Spradley pursed his lips and looked severely at Vice Consul Retief. Further, he said, you have displayed a complete lack of understanding of core discipline, the respect due a senior agent, and even the basic courtesies. Your aggravated displays of temper, ill-timed outbursts of violence, and almost incredible arrogance in the assumption of authority make your further retention as an officer agent of the diplomatic corps impossible. It will therefore be my unhappy duty to recommend your immediate... There was a muted buzz from the communicator. The ambassador cleared his throat. Well? A signal from Sector HQ, Mr. Ambassador, a voice said. Well, read it, Spradley snapped. Skip the preliminaries. Congratulations on the unprecedented success of your mission. The articles of agreement transmitted by you embody a most favorable resolution of the difficult Serenian situation, and you will form the basis of continued amicable relations between the terrestrial states and the Yil Empire. To you and your staff, full credit is due for a job well done. Signed, Deputy Assistant Secretary Spradley cut off the voice impatiently. He shuffled papers, eyed Retief sharply. Superficially, of course, an uninitiated observer might leap to the conclusion that the uh, results that were produced in spite of these uh, irregularities justify the latter. The ambassador smiled a sad, wise smile. This is far from the case, he said. I... The communicator burped softly. Confound it, Spradley muttered. Yes. Mr. Takai Kai has arrived the voice said. Shall I? Send him in at once. Spradley glanced at Retief. Only a two-syllable man, but I shall attempt to correct these false impressions and make some amends. The two terrestrials waited silently until the Yill Protocol chief tapped at the door. I hope, the ambassador said, that you will resist the impulse to take advantage of your unusual position. He looked at the door. Come in. Takai Kai stepped into the room, glanced at Spradley, turned to greet Retief in voluble yill. He rounded the desk to the ambassador's chair, motioned him from it, and sat down. I have a surprise for you, Retief, he said in Terran. I myself have made use of the teaching machine you so kindly lent us. That's fine, Takai Kai, Retief said. I'm sure Mr. Spradley will be interested in hearing what we have to say. Never mind, the yill said. I am here only socially, he looked around the room. So plainly you decorate your chamber, but it has a certain austere charm. He laughed a yill laugh. Oh, you are a strange breed, you terrestrials. You surprised us all. You know, one hears such outlandish stories. I tell you in confidence, we had expected you to be over pushes. Pushovers. Spradley said tonelessly. Such restraint! What pleasure you gave to those of us, like myself, of course, who appreciated your grasp of protocol. Such finesse! How subtly you appeared to ignore each overture, while neatly avoiding actual contamination. I can tell you there were those who thought, poor fools, that you had no grasp of etiquette. How gratified we were! we professionals, who could appreciate your virtuosity. 
when you placed matters on a comfortable basis by spurning the cat's meat. It was sheer pleasure, then, waiting to see what form your compliment would take. The yo offered orange cigars and stuffed one in his nostril. I confess, even I had not hoped that you would honor our admirable so signally. Oh, it is a pleasure to deal with fellow professionals who understand the meaning of protocol. Ambassador Spradley made a choking sound. This fellow has caught a chill, Tukai Kai said. He eyed Spradley dubiously. Step back, my man. I am highly susceptible. There is one bit of business I shall take pleasure in attending to, my dear Retief, Tukai Kai went on. He drew a large paper from his reticule. The admirable is determined that none other than yourself shall be accredited here. I have here my government's executor confirming you as terrestrial consul general to Yil. We shall look forward to your prompt return. Retief looked at Spradley. I'm sure the Corps will agree, he said. Then I shall be going, Tukai Kai said. He stood up. Hurry back to us, Retief. There is much that I would show you of Yil. I'll hurry, Retief said. And with a Yil wink, together... We shall see many high and splendid things. Well, what did you think of that one? I found the story quite fascinating. It is a bit of a departure for a classic science fiction story, but yet exciting and interesting. One can only imagine what diplomacy would be like when dealing with an alien race for the first time. We can see just how careful you might have to be. Jane Retief was the main character in our story, and a series of satirical science fiction adventures written by Keith Lamar. The stories were written over a 30-year span beginning in the early 1960s, without much regard to chronology or any type of scheme. The stories detailed the travels of Jane Retief in the Corps Diplomatique Terrestrienne. These stories are based on Lamar's real experiences in the United States Foreign Service, notably his time as Vice Counsel in Burma in the 1950s. Reorganization of the Foreign Service both before and after World War II were a source of considerable conflict at the time, as the diplomatic Old Guard were confronted with a New World situation and a new generation of diplomats men like Lamar, who took a more pragmatic approach to the service. This conflict undoubtedly represented itself in our story today. Interesting fact, if you say Retief's name backwards, it would be Fighter. How about that? Our author was Keith Lamar. He was an officer in the U.S. Air Force and a U.S. diplomat. He was best known for the Bolo series and, of course, Retief series. His other works include The Other Side of Time, A Trace of Memory, Dinosaur Beach, and A Plague of Demons. He was also a model plane enthusiast and published two dozen designs between 1956 and 1962 in the Model Airplane News and Aereo Modeler. He died on January 23, 1993, at the age of 67. Well, that was episode number 497, and the count continues to 500. This time, George McMillan and John Lamour helped us out, and both did a wonderful job. Thank you. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. Stories.